When we have an adult patient with sensorineural hearing loss, the most appropriate imaging modality is MRI. So when you see that history, but you're confronted with a CT, maybe it's because it's for preoperative planning prior to cochlear implantation. Much of your interpretation is going to be just like any other CT of the temporal bone, but there are going to be a few extra things you want to focus on to help the surgeon prepare for surgery. So here's a checklist for preoperative cochlear implantation CT imaging. First, everything you'd normally talk about on a CT of the temporal bone, external auditory canal, inner ear, middle ear, ossicles, everything the same, but there's a few additional fo focus of your attention. The mastoid bone gets additional attention, the facial nerve, the round and oval windows, and the inner ear. Let's talk about each of those in more detail. The mastoid bone. One thing to emphasize is the degree of pneumatization of the mastoid bone, and also the degree of aeration. These are similar concepts, but not the same thing. When we talk about pneumatization, we're talking about how many air cells that are formed in the mastoid bone. When we talk about aeration, we're talking about whether those air cells are filled with gas, or whether they're filled with inflammatory debris or fluid or anything besides gas. We wanna be careful about depression of the Tegman tympani. And we want to talk specifically about the jugular bulb and whether it's in its normal location. There is a wide range of normal pneumatization within the mastoid bones. Some people have a ton of pneumatization. It fills the mastoids, heads back, may even cross the landoid suture. It can affect the petrous apex, maybe asymmetrically, or even extend anteriorly into the zygomatic arch. Some people have relatively little mastoid pneumatization, just filling the area of the mastoid cells themselves without extension into all of those other areas. These are normal, and everything in between is normal. However, any air cell that undergoes chronic inflammation will begin to undergo atelectasis. We see this in the paranasal sinuses, where it can cause a silent sinus syndrome, and we see it in the mastoid air cells, which will shrink and disappear with chronic inflammation. When that happens, there are fewer mastoid air cells and more dense bone around them. This, of course, occurs progressively, and sometimes you just have a, a mild decrease in the degree of pneumatization, and sometimes you have a severe decrease with almost no air cells left. There isn't even a discernible mastoid antrum in this patient who has chronic inflammation of the mastoids. That this is important is that when the surgeon is drilling through this bone to get at the middle ear, it's much easier to go through pneumatized air cells than it is to go through this dense bone. Another important aspect is degree of aeration, right? So here is an example where the mastoid is has decreased pneumatization, but is still completely aerated. And here is an example with decreased pneumatization, but no aeration. You can have any combination. You can have well pneumatized, but poorly aerated, poorly pneumatized, but well aerated, like this year. It doesn't have to be 100% filled. It can be partially aerated or near completely uh, filled with inflammatory debris. This is important surgically because the surgeon doesn't want to go through this inflammatory debris or, God forbid, an, an acute infection that might infect the hardware. The position of the Tegman tympani is very important for this surgery. The normal Tegman tympani is a more or less straight line that runs essentially parallel to the lateral semicircular canal. So we want to see this as a continuous line, and we want to see an almost parallel line for the semicircular canal. In this patient, we see that the medial aspect of the Peters apex is not aligned with the tegment. The tegment has been depressed, drawn down, and it is no longer parallel to the lateral semicircular canal. So what does this? This can be the result of chronic inflammation with atelectasis of these air cells, or it can be the result of chronically increased intracranial pressure with remodeling of the skull base. Either way, 
a surgeon who's trying to drill through this area to get to the middle ear doesn't want to find themselves accidentally intracranial. So that's why the depressed tegment is important. Similarly, we don't want to accidentally run into a jugular bulb. So we want to discuss the position of the jugular bulb and make sure that it's not high riding. The definition of a high riding jugular bulb differs depending on different authors. Some people say if the jugular bulb goes as high as the basal turn of the cochlea, that should be considered high riding. Uh, some people say it has to get as high as the internal auditory canal to be considered high riding. I think either way you want to be descriptive. Even a jugular bulb of this height uh, could potentially be an unpleasant surprise surgically. In patients who have decreased pneumatization due to chronic inflammation of their air cells, when these air cells shrink, the jugular bulb can be drawn out laterally, and we call this a lateralized jugular bulb. Here's the normal position of the jugular bulb. There is a little notch that it sits into, but it is essentially along one face entirely exposed to the posterior fossa. And this piece of bone here is called the jugular plate. When you have chronic inflammation and diminished pneumatization, the jugular bulb will be drawn out laterally and it no longer lies in the socket that is prepared for it along the medial aspect of the posterior fossa. Instead, it's drawn deep into the mastoid. And you can imagine that a surgeon taking a posterior approach here might accidentally find their way into the lateralized jugular bulb. So we want to talk about the position of the jugular bulb, especially in patients who have chronic inflammation. Moving on to the facial nerve. Uh, we want to discuss the facial nerve in particular, any displacement of the tympanic segment of the facial nerve, any displacement of the second genu away from the posterior aspect of the mesotympanum. We want to talk about facial nerve dehiscence, and I want to draw a distinction between displacement of the tympanic segment of the facial nerve and facial nerve dehiscence, so we'll talk about that more. And there are other dehiscences within the inner ear that are important, in this case in particular cochleofacial dehiscence. So here's an example where the tympanic segment of the facial nerve on this coronal CT is overlying the oval window. You can imagine that if you wanted to do surgery and approach this oval window, that facial nerve would be in the way. And you can see it is got a couple of millimeters separating it from the stapes, which is depicted right here. I want to note specifically that you can still see a bony covering over top of the facial nerve here. That canal is intact. This is not a dehiscent facial canal. This is just an inferiorly displaced tympanic segment within the normal bony fallopian canal. It still gets in the way surgically, but it's not dehiscent. Another way that the facial nerve can become displaced is uh, to have the second genu in the wrong position or to have it be flattened. Normally, the second genu of the facial nerve is on the medial aspect of the tympanic cavity. Here it's been displaced laterally, and on this sagittal reformatted image, instead of a nice 90-degree uh, turn that we would expect for the second genu, it is this slow, um, uh, obtuse angle coming down the back right there. That is the second genu right there, and it should be almost 90 degrees instead. It's nowhere near that. So this is a, a, a improper or a ectopic placement of the second genu. It's been displaced anteriorly and inferiorly and blunted. Now here is true facial nerve dehiscence. In this case, let me point out the stapes right here on this coronal CT, and there's the facial nerve. They are touching. The facial nerve is out of its normal canal. It has fallen down and is now lying on top of the stapes. This usually causes uh, hearing loss, if not facial nerve dysfunction. That is a true dehiscence. When these two objects are in contact, there is no longer a bony covering holding that facial nerve in place. Once again, the facial nerve is in a position to interfere with any surgery that tries to approach the oval window. So it's a similar problem, but a different disease needing different terminology. 
The other dehiscence that we want to be particularly aware of in this preoperative imaging is cochleofacial dehiscence. As the name suggests, this is a dehiscence between the upper turns of the cochlea and the facial canal. Normally on this oblique Stenvers reformatted image, we'll see a thin line of bone that separates the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve from the upper turns of the cochlea. I've intentionally done a reformat that lays out the cochlea here. In the setting of dehiscence, that bony covering is absent and there is a potential communication between the cochlea and the facial canal. This is one of the third window phenomena and can cause all of the same um, the same problems that superior semicircular canal dehiscence causes. But in addition, if a cochlear implant is placed at deep into the turns of the cochlea and accidentally perforates, uh, it, it can cause disruption to the facial nerves. So that's why this dehiscence is particularly important prior to cochlear implantation. Here is what cochleofacial dehiscence looks like in the axial plane because you're only going to do those reformatted Stenvers images if you have some suspicion that this is what you're looking for. Uh, that little break right there between the upper turns of the cochlea and the labyrinthine segment of the facial nerve, that's what you're looking for. Uh, if you just use the axials, you're going to overcall this. So when you see this, go ahead and do the extra reformatted images, uh, thin cuts with special obliques are, are really needed to be absolutely certain that you're dealing with a cochleofacial dehiscence. Now let's talk about the round and oval windows. In the windows, you're worried about two things. You're worried about stenosis, where there is bony covering what should be a membranous window, and crowding, as we talked about with the facial nerve. So here's an example of stenosis in the round window, that there should be an immediate transition from air to the perilymph of the inner ear, there should not be any bone in between the two of them. So that's stenosis of the round window. Here is the oval window. You can actually see the crura of the stapes there and there. And underneath those crura should be the stapes footplate. The stapes footplate is radiolucent relative to the underlying otic capsule. And so that should be, there should be no visible bone there. We should be able to go straight from the gas of the middle ear to the perilymph and endolymph of the vestibule. But when you see bony covering there, that's an oval window stenosis or oval window sclerosis, if you like. Uh, this is just another example of what we've already talked about, displacement of the tympanic segment of the facial nerve. Now it is overlying that oval window, uh, crowding the window and making the surgery more difficult. Regarding the inner ear, one of the things that's most important for us to identify in preoperative cochlear implant evaluation is labyrinthitis ossificans. I know it's something you always look at, but it's particularly important here. All of the other anomalies that affect the inner ear are also important because you don't want to implant an ear where it's not going to improve the hearing because there's a problem further downstream. I'm not really going to talk about all the possible inner ear anomalies. Those lectures are already on the channel, and if you haven't seen them, uh, yeah, please go check them out. The cochlear nerve uh, in children, we need to make sure there's no cochlear nerve aplasia, again, because you'd hate to put an implant in uh, to no avail because downstream there's nothing listening for those signals. So I know when labyrinthitis looks like this, you're going to see it, right? It's a complete whiteout. You can't even see any of the turns of the cochlea, maybe a little ghost of a bit right there. But you've got to be looking not just for these severe cases, but for these cases, where all you see is a thin wisp of increased density in the center of the basal turn of the cochlea. That's subtle labyrinthitis ossificans, um, and, and that's really what you're looking for, not just these obvious cases. Why is it important to identify labyrinthitis ossificans? Because there are different types of cochlear implants that can be used to overcome the difficulties of labyrinthitis ossificans. You can get a double array cochlear implant where there are two electrode arrays instead of just one. These are shorter, straighter, more rigid than the, their counterpart. Uh, they won't go as deep into the cochlea, uh, but you can still get enough nodes inserted because you're putting two uh, arrays in instead of one. 
So it's a whole different instrument to be used when there is labyrinthitis ossificans that would interfere with placement of the array. Uh, of course, cochlear nerve aplasia, important in children. This is a steady state free procession sequence, high resolution cross section, sagittal cross section through the inner ear. And normally you see four nerves the facial nerve, the cochlear nerve, and the two vestibular nerves, superior and inferior. Um, but uh, uh, this, in, in this year, you only see three. You see uh, the facial and the vestibulars, but the cochlear nerve is absent. That's cochlear nerve aplasia. And this is not an ear that you want to put a cochlear implant into. Of course, this discussion is only really useful in children. You don't lose hearing as an adult as a result of, of this particular anomaly. So in summary, what are the goals of preoperative imaging for cochlear implantation? What you're helping the surgeon do is choose a side. Uh, often it's more or less a coin toss, which side to put the implant in. So seemingly minor contraindications may tip the scales away from one side and towards the other. There is substantial controversy about whether the uh, cochlear implant should go in the good ear, that is the one with better residual hearing, or the bad ear, the one with worse residual hearing. There's arguments on both sides, and over the course of my career, I've seen this pendulum swing back and forth. Uh, the, the good ear people say, well, you want to maximize the eventual outcome after cochlear implantation, so you want to use the best ear for the best overall outcome. Uh, the other side of that equation is, well, you don't want to potentially interfere with what's left in the good ear, so let's work on the ear that doesn't matter as much. Either way, the information that comes from the radiologist is critical in choosing an ear during preoperative imaging for cochlear implantation.